batsman's out this morning, and she's been fighting that lupus, and so it's good to see her out this morning and having trouble making both services in the morning and that kind of problem. So good to see her. And then uh, Brother Gene said that he's been under the weather with some bronchitis, and so he's had some medicine and feeling a little better than the team break for him as well. It's good to see her out this morning. If you would take your Bibles, we're going to go to First Thessalonians 3. And a couple weeks ago, we were in the first part of this chapter in our study through 1 Thessalonians, and so we're going to continue with the thought um, as Paul has just received this report back from Timothy, and uh, Paul begins to kind of address uh, the Thessalonians after hearing from Timothy coming back. So we will read, uh, we'll begin in, in chapter 2, verse number 17 this morning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 17, and we'll read down through chapter 3 and just kind of get back in our minds where we left off a couple weeks ago. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 17, the Bible says, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we, would, we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. Night and day praying exceedingly, that we might see your face, and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself, and our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And so Timothy has went. Uh, Paul said, you know, they were chased away. They had to leave. They went to Berea um, and, and kind of got chased out of the synagogue there in Thessalonica. And so their concern for the, the brethren there, for the church there, this young church that had just been established, uh, has been overwhelming. It's been on Paul's mind. And so they, they decide, as we looked at last time, it was good to send Timothy back and to get a report and where Timothy could kind of strengthen them in their in their faith and kind of get to know how they're doing. And then he would bring this report back. And so uh, just the idea this morning is maybe at work you have a year-end report or something you send out. Maybe a business or a college will send you a year-end report and it gives you an opportunity to see how they're doing. Uh, or to see how you're doing in your performance of duties. Uh, maybe it's a yearly evaluation again at work that tells you how you're doing and maybe what your goals might be or how you uh, performed in the year past and what they expect of you. But it kind of gives you an opportunity just to see where you stand at that moment. And so I think for us as Christians as well, um, we're not necessarily under the, the scrutiny of somebody else. But let's, let's say that the Spurgeons came in last week and they spent five or six services with us. And uh, now that they go away, they might look back and say, you know, Victory Baptist Church is on the right path. Those people are standing fast and they're standing firm in the faith that they always have had. And so that report that they may take to other people or that they may pass on or that they may think about. But ultimately for us as Christians, we ought to be evaluating ourselves. We ought to be able to look and say, am I standing firm in the faith? What is the state of my charity towards my brethren and my fellow church members? What's the state of my charity towards those outside the church and my community? And so I, I think that as Paul breaks this down and he begins to look at this report from Timothy, 
there's some truths that we can pull from it this morning. So that's what we want to look at. We're going to look at verses 6 through 13, Lord willing, if time permits. So let's, let's pray, and then we'll begin looking at this this morning. Lord, once again, we bow before you. Uh, Lord, just thankful for your work in our hearts and lives. Lord, to be able to stand before you this morning, saved by your grace, and on my way to heaven because of you and your willingness to come to this earth and to die for my sins. Lord, for all of us that know that this morning, we have a desire to serve you and to love you. And Lord, I pray that this would just be a reminder of us to keep our focus on you and our focus on serving you, uh, that we may just fix things that aren't right, that we would get back in line with where we ought to be. For anyone that may not be saved this morning, that they would realize their need of a Savior, uh, understand, Lord, that they need to place their faith and trust in you, and that they may be saved this morning, and their lives will be changed completely. Lord, I pray that you meet with us this morning, that your Holy Spirit uh, would speak through me, that you would teach all of us something, Lord, this morning. And otherwise, Lord, we are wasting our time to even being here. I pray that you'd help us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So verse number 6, we see where Paul says, Now when Timothy came back uh, from you unto us and brought us good tidings. And so Timothy has went, uh, and he's now returned, and he's, he shared with Paul and Silas and those that were there. Uh, this report. And so we see that he says it's of good tidings. It's a good report. Uh, he brings back a good report of how they're standing. Uh, and so the first thing we see there in verse number six is that this report uh, is of their faith and charity. And so number one, their faith is that they're, they're trusting God. And so Paul and Timothy and Silas, when they traveled into Thessalonica, began to teach in the synagogues and they, they began to uh, proclaim Christ and they saw people's lives change. People come to know Christ as their Savior, as we saw in chapter 1, and they began to turn from idols to serve the living and true God. So now, now Timothy has opportunity to go back and to see that, hey, they're standing firm in their faith. They, they have grasped that and they continue to serve God. They continue to reach out to see people saved. So the second part, he says there is their charity, their love for one another and for others. Uh, he, that idea that we love as Christ loves. And we preached on this a few weeks ago, and then Brother Spurgeon hit the idea of charity as well in one of his messages. And so that, that love of God, the love that God loved us without anything in return. And so, so many times in our world, we see people that love others because they get something back. They love somebody because of what it gives to them. Or I love you or I do this for you because of what I get in return. God, God sought nothing in return. Um, God knew exactly, as we've heard before, what he was getting when he saved me. Um, and yet he saved me anyway. Yet he died on the cross to save me from my sins. That's love. That's true love. And that's the love of God that we ought to be showing to others. And so their love then and desire towards Paul was the second thing that we see. Uh, he says there in the end of chapter, or verse number 6 there, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. So their love and desire toward Paul and his ministry, the, the appreciation that they had for him, that he came in and shared the gospel with them. And, and I believe that, that so many times, and, and in my own life as well, is that we don't take the opportunity. God tells us maybe to hand a tract to somebody, to share our testimony and we, we choose not to. I'm too busy. I go my own way. And I think we, we hinder ourselves of some blessings that God would give us. That he would give us opportunity, not just maybe to hand the track, but to have some conversation. Maybe to see somebody saved. But on the back side of that, when somebody comes to know Christ as their Savior and they truly grasp it, the appreciation they show to you because God used you in their life to save them from the horrible pit of hell. And when they grasp that, the appreciation they show to you is, again, an opportunity for you to give glory to God. And so we rob ourselves of that opportunity when we pull back or when we're afraid to share Christ with others. And so we see these three things, their faith, their charity, and their love and desire for Paul and his ministry and to be a blessing for him to understand that they still stand in the faith. Notice that, uh, again, in verse 6, when Timothy came back, he says he brought good tidings. Uh, and he says, verse 7, Therefore, brethren, when we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. Uh, so this news convinced Paul that Satan's plans to disrupt God's work. Uh, he calls them there in verse number 5, the deceiver. Uh, that Satan would try to deceive them. That Satan would try to, to put things in their path or to draw them away from their faith. That, that Satan would try to get their attention on something else besides God and besides serving God. And listen, church, the, the devil's doing the same thing to us this morning. 
when we want to come to church, Satan will throw out a bunch of things that we can that can draw our attention. A lot of things going on in our world today that can draw us away. Some of those are being good things, but it takes us out of where we ought to be. Sometimes we do want to go on visitation, or we do want to be part of outreach, but then Satan gives us something, the deceiver throws something out there, and it changes our focus, it changes our attention to something else. And so we need to understand that Satan is the deceiver. Paul calls him the deceiver. That's a, just a simple name for him, but it ought to ring a bell in our minds that, man, not only is there a, a, an enemy out there, not only am I fighting a, a enemy that's as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but if he realizes he can't devour me and my faith, he's going to try to get me off track by deceiving me. So he may not totally destroy me this morning, but can he make me ineffective if my attention somewhere else? If I'm not doing and, and focused on what I ought to be doing, of course he can. And so he's happy with whatever he gets. And so again, it ought to be a, a thing, a, a warning to us to keep our attention on what's right and what we ought to be doing. So notice the attention that Paul puts on, or the emphasis Paul puts on their faith. Uh, again, I would say in verse number 7, he says that they were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. So it's their faith in God, their salvation that they have grasped a hold of. This salvation that the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 makes me a new creature in Christ, a new creation. I now have new desires. I now have a new purpose in life. There's new things I, I uh, follow after. There's new desires in my heart. And so Paul's saying it is your faith that has comforted us. So when you see a Christian that gets saved and they get into church and they begin to learn about Christ and their heart's on fire, they, they have a desire to know all they can. Again, that's a comfort to us, and it's a comfort in whatever afflictions or, or trials and troubles that we have in life, and it makes it worth every day. We've mentioned that about the school, haven't we? We've seen two kids saved this year, a first grader and a second grader. Not every day of school goes exactly how we planned it. Not every day starts out with bright sun and smiles, and we're just as happy as we can be. There are trials, and there are tests every day. There are days that we would just say, man, I could like just go back to bed, right? I know. But when we see a little kid come to know Christ as their Savior, we look back at all those days and say, I would do them again to see somebody come to Christ. And so Paul's saying there, uh, it's your faith. But notice, this is the fourth out of five times that Paul played, says the word faith or puts faith. Notice in verse number two, he says at the end, and to comfort you concerning your faith. Verse number five there in the middle, he says, uh, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. Verse number six, he talks about their faith, the tidings of their faith and charity. Verse number seven, we've said it a couple of times, it, it comforted them in their affliction and distress by their faith. And then verse number 10, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So there's this emphasis on their faith. Their solid trust in Jesus Christ. And, and again, Christian, are getting into the Word of God and understanding who God is, what God has done for us. And, and by understanding Him and placing our complete faith and trust and allowing God to be God in our lives. Because God is good. And God does things according to His will and purpose. And not always do we see the benefit of that. Uh, but that was one of the things I told the, the uh, young adult class this morning is that when I become a disciple of Christ, I simply place my life, I, I place my trust in God and I allow Him to be God. And knowing that no matter what He puts me through, no matter how hard the trust or the uh, trial or, or test today might be, it's for a purpose later. And I'll pass this test because God brought me through that test. And so not always does life go the way we want it to. But we need to trust God that He knows best for us. And so it's our faith. And, and Paul puts a great emphasis on faith. Five times here in chapter 3, um, in these first uh, 11, 10 verses, that he mentions their faith. And, but I would also say that our relationship with God is, when our relationship with God is correct, all other things come in line. So I believe that Paul is pointing out their faith, their trust in Christ, getting that relationship with God right, and then my love for the brethren, my love for the world, my desire to serve God, all that will come in mind when my relationship with God is correct. 
And so our relationship with God is most important, and we need to focus on that. We need to keep that right. And then everything else is kind of incidental. Everything else is just life. But my relationship with God is that source of power. And that's that source of life that allows me to live life on all the other uh, aspects of life that are out there. So these three things, I believe, are indicators of our faith and our relationship with God. So I asked us this morning, what is the state of our faith in God? Where do we stand this morning? Are you saved? Do you know Christ as our Savior? If you do, are we living what we believe? Do we live what we believe? Do we trust God to be God in our lives? What is the state of our love toward one another and others? How do we love our fellow church members? Is there something between us and somebody else that we need to get right? Are we holding grudges? Are we holding things that ought to be given over to God and allow Him to deal with? How about our community? Do we have a burden to see people saved? And I'll tell you right now, I don't think we do. I'll tell you, I think we fail in this area. Yeah, we might, we might verbalize it, but we're not putting action to our words. There's a lot of people in our community that need Christ this morning. And I don't believe we're doing what we could be to reach them. And it's a shame. What is the state of our love and desire for fellow Bible believers and biblical ministries? And, and I'm talking about solid Bible ministries. Do we support them? And I know we have a lot of missionary things, and, and that's a good thing. But let's keep our focus on what's right, and let's help those that are doing right. All right, so by the time Paul wrote this, he had already heard from Timothy. Verse 6, um, he says, But now when Timothy came from you unto us. So Timothy's returned, and Paul has this report. Um, and he understands that they had withstood great temptation, as he says in verse 6. But Paul's delighted that they were strong in their faith and charity. Um, Paul's pleased that they wanted him to come back and minister to them. And he again, in the end of verse 6, reminds them that he also has a desire to see them. He says, your desire to see us, uh, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. And so Paul's heart really was people and, and pouring himself into them and to see them grow in their faith. But notice in verse number 7 again, the comfort that is received. Number 2, the comfort that was received. Uh, Paul says in verse 7, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. So Paul's pleased and comforted that his spiritual children have been strong in the faith. And, and again, if we would understand that, maybe as a disciple of Christ, my ultimate goal is to become a disciple maker. My, my, my purpose in becoming in Christ, I might say that, God's purpose in making me a disciple is that I would then go out and make other disciples. So when I do that, my, my burden to be see people saved ought to be not just to see them saved, but to see them grow in their relationship with God. Get into church. Get into the Word of God. Grow. And know the things that I know. Why? Ultimately, that they can become a disciple maker. That they can go out. And, and Dr. Rumble told us, preached that in Sunday school two weeks ago. Um, that we would get out and make disciples. And that we would invest in the lives of people. Again, um, all the things I can amass in this world, I cannot take one of them with me other than the lives of other people. When I invest in the salvation or in the soul of another person, that's the only thing that will be in heaven with me when I die. So we need to focus on those things. We need to be about our Father's business, what He's left us here for. So Paul mentions that this comfort came amidst affliction and distress, understanding their state of faith, understanding that they were uh, still growing, they were still serving God, and helped Paul in his affliction. And it seems that Paul's affliction and distress never stopped. Um, but his, his focus wasn't on his distress, was it? When Paul's sitting in prison, what's he doing? Writing books of the Bible. Paul's sitting in prison with Silas, what's he doing? Singing and praising God, seeing the jailer come to Christ. So sometimes, Christians, we get focused on us. We get focused on the issue that's dealing with, that is our problem, that is causing me distress. Rather than keeping my focus on what I'm supposed to be doing. And if I focus on what God has put me here for, then I don't focus on me and I see lives change. And, and so Paul continued, even though he was distressed, even though trials and tribulations were on him constantly, his focus was on doing the will of God. His focus was on seeing people's lives change. And so Jesus had told Paul in Acts 9.16, I must show him what great things he will suffer. Uh, Paul was the persecutor of the church. He traveled around killing Christians. And uh, when he got saved, Christ told him, look, you're in for a long, hard road. Um, but again, what helps, what helps us get through that? 
our relationship with Christ and knowing that God knows best. And Paul was the man that he was because God tested him and tried his faith and grew him according to his will. None of us like to suffer. But I tell you, I believe it's biblical that one of the highest callings we can have is to suffer for Christ. We have grown, uh, I believe, in, in our country, we have grown in, in our churches to have such an aversion uh, to difficulty and discomfort that we will do nothing when, when discomfort comes. We quit when something doesn't go our way. Uh, what if Christ had quit? Remember in the garden? He wasn't even on the cross, but he was sweating great drops of blood for you and me. He was praying, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass by. Wouldn't would we go the distance? Would we do that? What if Christ quit? When would he have quit? If he was us, how long would it have taken? Maybe I'd have made it through the garden. Maybe when they put the crown of thorns on my head, but when they put that cross on my back and I had to carry it up the mountain, would I stop? Would I lay down and allow them to put the nails? Where would we have stopped? And so as Christians, we gotta understand. And I think these are some questions we gotta ask ourselves. God allows us to go through trials and tribulations sometimes, but we quit. We don't, we never make it through the trial. We never make it through the difficulty. We're not willing to suffer the persecution. We won't go out when it's 100 degrees and knock on doors. Why not? That's what our job is. That's why we're following. What if Christ said, man, it's just too hot to go to the cross today. I'm going to quit. Christians, we need to, to stand fast. We need to do what we've been called to do. Um, just to know their faith, Paul says, had been so strong, it encouraged Paul. When you stand strong in the faith, it's encouraging to your pastor. When I hear about you witnessing to somebody, when you tell me about somebody getting saved, when you're, you share your stories about how you had a test at work, it's encouraging to me. And it's encouraging to our fellow Christians when we stand, when we stand fast in the faith. And so we need to. We need to do it to encourage one another, and I believe it's what we are called to do. Notice verse number 8. Paul now says, for now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. And so we want to look at this idea again. Stand fast. We might say the word, uh, stay the course. Stay, word, stay focused. Stay the course. Uh, stand fast in what God has called you to do. So the word stand fast, or that idea, is it's pictured here as an army that refuses to retreat, even under immense pressure or when being assaulted by the enemy. Um, my thought was that when we have our field day at the school and we put that big rope out there to play tug of war, everybody thinks that they're going to be the one on the team that's going to keep that rope from getting pulled. And so you, you dig your feet down and you hunker down and you get that rope. And I watch some of the kids and they wrap the rope around them and you're just waiting because you know they're about to go for a ride. And once that rope starts dragging, they're, they're stuck. And so... The idea, though, is, is that mentality. Why don't we as Christians stand fast, hunker down, get in the rope, and, and pull your weight? And so Paul's saying, or if we will now live, verse 8, if ye stand fast in the Lord. And so for us as Christians, let's stand fast. Get, get hold of the rope. Get hold of what God's doing, and let's be involved. Don't be afraid. Uh, watch them crazy kids. And, and one year they'll do it. What do they do the next year? Wrap the rope around them and they go for a ride again. Why? As Christians, let's throw the caution to the wind. Get a hold of the rope and let it be. To serve God with everything you've got. Let's look at a couple of these. This is a frequent uh, exhortation of Paul. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 58 this morning. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. He uses it. It's the word uh, steadfast here. But the same idea. He says, therefore, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So number one, we need to be steadfast in the work of the Lord. We need to get involved in it. And, and as Paul says, grab the rope, hunker down, and get ready. And don't give up. Don't stop. And stay in the fight. Stay in the work. And notice, on the tug of war thing, my labor might be in vain. I might get drugged the whole way across the field. But when I'm in the labor for the Lord and I've got the rope for God, my labor is not in vain. It's not going to be in vain. So get a hold of it. Number two, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. It should probably be on the, just the next page over. He says, watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. 
Quit you like men. Be strong. Christians, this is 2017. Men aren't men anymore. But we as Christians are called to be men. We're called to take a stand and to make a difference for God. He says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Understand what God has called you to. Understand what it costs God to provide your salvation. And appreciate it so much that you'll stand fast in the faith. Be strong and do what it takes to see others come to Christ. Number three, Galatians 5, verse 1. Galatians 5, verse 1. Galatians 5, and verse 1, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I I'm giving freedom in Christ, freedom from sin, freedom from the world. And he says, grab the rope and forget those things. Don't get entangled with the world again. That would work about as well as me grabbing that tug of war rope. And about the time they start yanking on the other end, grabbing my cell phone, hey, Mom, how are you? <laughs> I'm along for the ride, right? He says, grab the rope in the Christian life. Forget the world. Don't get entangled again. God has made us free. He's given us freedom in Christ so that we don't have to serve sin. We don't have to serve the flesh and the devil again. I have liberty in Christ. And again, Christianity today wants to take this and say, well, I've got liberty to listen to what I want to. I've got liberty to wear, to say, to do. That's not what this is saying. He's saying you have liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We're free in Christ. Enjoy that freedom. Stay within the boundaries of Christ. All right, number four, Ephesians 6.11. Ephesians 6 and verse 11. The kids, uh, the young kids just went through here in their uh, armor of God. Number, uh, Ephesians 6, verse 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, you know, I, I think about it sometimes. God doesn't put us on some scary mission out there all by ourselves. He says, I've given you the armor. Put it on. And I, all I do is expect you to stand. Stand fast in what you know. And in on your understanding of who I am, knowing that I'll take care of you. Stand. Verse number 13, he says there, um, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. And so in this one, we, we can stand in the evil day, we can stand in the armor of God, and we can stand in the truth. And we, we need to stand fast in the truth that God has given to us. Number six, Philippians 1 and verse 20. Or Philippians 1, 27, I'm sorry. Philippians 1, verse 27. He says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We need to stand fast in a sense of unity, in a sense of purpose as a church and say, we're going to make a difference in Kobe, Florida. We're going to make a difference in our little part of the world that God has given to us. And by faith, we'll make a difference. We're going to take the gospel to all that will listen to us. And, and the idea is stand fast. And, and as a group of people, we have to make the decision. We have to come together to do this work. Philippians 4 verse 1. Philippians 4.1. says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. You understand what Paul's saying? You're my joy and crown. You mean everything to me. I've invested everything to see you saved and to see you serving God. Stand fast in serving God. Stand fast in what you know and then the last one, back to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, and verse 15. It 
2 Thessalonians 2, 15, he says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. And again, those traditions, those things we've been taught, uh, serving God and not tradition for tradition's sake, not tradition for religious sake, but tradition in the fact that I, I grasp that this Bible is true. I grasp that this is the way we serve God. I grasp that this is the music that is honoring to God. And so in the traditions as I have been taught, not tradition for tradition's sake, not tradition in just what we do, but our tradition in, in what has been passed down to us in and through the Word of God by godly men who have studied and prepared and have passed it on to us. And we need to be passing that down uh, faithfully to the next generation. And so we see from this that Paul has new life uh, there in, back in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verse number 7, that he has new life breathed into him. He says, we live. Uh, if he stand fast in the Lord. And so this has been an encouragement to him. Uh, it's been a blessing to him to hear that they stand fast in their faith, that they're strong. And notice in verse number 9 that he says they give thanksgiving. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. And so the, the word render there is an idea of paying back or the sense of paying back something owed. It's a due. Um, so I render to God thanksgiving. God has allowed me to be a part of a ministry. God has allowed me to invest in the lives of others. I've seen that investment come full circle where they're now serving God and they're seeing people saved and investing in the lives of others. What can I do but thank God? Because God has done it all. It's not me. I would never be saved if God didn't invest himself in me. So it's the least I can do is invest myself in someone else and the glory and thanks goes to God. And so... Like Paul, um, or Paul says here, it's, it's a joy uh, for your sakes before our God. So Paul, like John, has the same idea. John says in, in 3 John verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Listen, what? I'm not, I'm not John and I'm not Paul, but there's no greater joy for a pastor than to see his flock or to see the flock that God has allowed him to shepherd walking in truth. Walking in the Word of God, living their lives in accordance with the Word of God. I, I believe pastors are discouraged, hearts, pastors' hearts get torn when we do things that are totally opposite to the Word of God. When we know that we've preached it, and we just covered that, and look at these, what, look what they're doing. It, it breaks the heart of a pastor. Um, and again, is understanding. I know we're all human beings, and we all make choices, we all make mistakes, we all do things. Um, but God has given us the Word of God. He's given us the Spirit of God. He's given us a church that we can be in, that we can hear the Word of God preach, and it ought to make a difference in our lives. When we just turn our back on all that, when we quench the Holy Spirit, we don't avail ourselves of the preaching. Maybe we show up, but we don't listen. We don't apply it. It's heartbreaking. And so, not just for me, but for your fellow Christians, when they see those things in your life. Okay. Uh, so we, again, ought to be careful. And again, it's this self-focus, right? This report's coming from Timothy back to Paul, but we all can report on ourselves this morning. It's an inventory we need to do for ourselves. Where am I standing in my faith? Am I standing fast in the things God's called me to do? Would I bring joy to God if he was to look at my life this morning? Um, and, and if we're honest with ourselves, that's what's going to help us to live our lives where we ought to be. So Paul found the highest sense of ministry joy in knowing that his children in the faith were growing and walking in truth. And again, I believe this is the great, this is the desire of any true pastor, any true shepherd. They want to see um, my heart's desire is to invest in you anything that God's invested in me. To see all of us as a church grow in our love with God, our relationship with God, and to see us grow in our service with God. And when we begin to do that, or as we do that, that's such a blessing. And so it led Paul to the worship of God in thanksgiving and rejoicing. Paul is so grateful of their stand for Christ. Uh, he says he has nothing to pray for them but to praise God. And so uh, what a blessing that Paul had to be able to, to praise God through the lives of the Thessalonians. Uh, Paul says joy is in his heart. This is the fruit of his labors. He's invested in them. And again, that, re that investment has come full uh, circle. It's true for us as well. If we invest in the lives of others, we'll see that, that blessing. 
when we see them growing in Christ. And I believe it's true for us as parents as well. Never, I, I just wrote down there, never um, forego the opportunity to invest in your kids spiritually. Um, there's so many times we're walking around or we see something or something happens and it gives us opportunity to, to spiritually give them a lesson. Um, you'll never regret investing in them spiritually. But you'll look back at times and say, man, instead of doing that, I should have been investing in that. Instead of foregoing that opportunity, I should have made the most of it. Um, no, the next thing we see in verse 10 is their endless prayer. They, Paul says they pray night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So Paul's desire is still is to get back there to see them, uh, to spend time with them, to invest in them more. Uh, again, Paul was uh, didn't have the opportunity to stay in Thessalonica. He didn't have time to really stay longer than about three weeks from what we can see uh, back in the book of Acts. So what he taught them was a, was a huge amount in those three weeks. But Paul would love to go back and be able to invest in them more and perfect their faith. And I believe in the verses... Uh, next few verses we see what he would like and notice again in the end of verse 10 it was their faith he says now god himself and our father and our lord jesus christ direct our way unto you so that's paul's prayer to god specifically the father and christ so in this prayer is that he is he's saying god is god and jesus christ is god they're equal right god is one person of the trinity christ is the second part of the trinity both are god um and he's his request is to God, uh, God the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Direct our way unto you. So his desire, his request, is that God would bring him back to Thessalonica where he could invest more in the Thessalonians there and uh, to see them grow in their faith. And notice verse 12 and 13. I believe this is, is the uh, what he would perfect in them or what he would like to see. He says, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love, one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. So Paul wants them to grow in their faith and charity, in their love for others, as well as for one another, even as we do for you. And, and again, uh, that desire, I believe, is our love for God grows, and we understand his heart and compassion for other people, our love for people grows. And then lastly, verse 13, he says there, that there to, to the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the end... Uh, maybe we would say the purpose or Paul's end desire uh, and ultimately Christ's desire would be that we would be established in our hearts, unblameable in holiness. Uh, again, that the idea is that nobody can look at us and say they have sin in their lives or, or look at us and say they're not unblameable in holiness. And, and this again is one of the, uh, the qualifications of a pastor or a deacon. Uh, not that they're sin free, right? Not that they're uh, don't have a sin nature, but the fact that they're not living a life that would bring reproach. And so God, what Paul is saying here is to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. That we can stand before God and say, look, I, I've confessed any sin that I know. I've asked you to search my heart to reveal to me anything that's not right. And I will do all that I can to allow your Holy Spirit to help me to fix those things. Ask God to search our hearts. Ask God to make us and to cleanse us from sin. And then have a heart that will walk with God and will allow God to reveal those things to us. All right? So in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all his saints. And I believe, again, this is a reference to what Paul's getting ready to teach in chapter 4, when he says there in verses number um, 16 and 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So I ask you this morning, it could be today. You could come back before we make it to lunch today. How's your heart? Are you ready? If God came back this afternoon and you stood before him, what is it that you would wish you had made better? this morning, or you had made right of him, or that you would have confessed. And so as we move into the um, invitation time, I would just ask you this morning, that he may come back today. Are you ready? Are you saved this morning? Do you know him as your Savior? Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation? If not, 
We're going to start singing here in a few minutes. We'll have the invitation, uh, and you have opportunity to come forward. Come, come see me, and we'll get somebody, or I'll take the Bible, and I'll show you how you can be saved this morning. For us as Christians, we've read through it. How's your faith this morning? How's your relationship with God? How's your charity for others? And what's your desire to see other people saved? And then, are we walking? Do we have, are we moving in the purpose that our hearts are unblameable in holiness before God? And what is it that we would fix this morning prior to God coming back? Because it could, it could be this afternoon. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the morning. Thank you for the word of God again. And, and 